We are in the book of Ruth, and we'd encourage you to turn there with us. We're going to be in chapter 4 today. I had planned to finish the book of Ruth today, but it won't happen. We're going to finish it next week. We're going to only deal with chapter 4, verses 1 through 10 uh, this morning. But really, this is a book of God's individual watch care over our lives. So just as Tori, trusting God with her, the outcome of her life, turning her dreams, hopes, and everything, her aspirations over to God, and he can be trusted. And how do we know that? Because we know what he has said in the word of God. And in fact, the book of Ruth is an amazing and beautiful illustration of how God works out all the details of a person's life. So if the book of Esther is about God's watch care for all of his people, the book of Ruth is about God's individual concern for one of his people. And so you look of this, I hope that you're growing in confidence in God's concern, his care, his love, his kindness, his guidance, and his watch care in your life. And so we're looking at this, not that it's a prescriptive text. We looked at last week. A prescriptive text would be in a First Thessalonians 4. This is God's will for you in a New Covenant believer sense. These are descriptive texts. So we're looking at the Old Testament, and we're looking at some of the things in here, and we have to draw this a case study, right, from 3,000 years ago. This is how God, the living God, was working with real people back then. And so we're looking at that. We're praying through that. Hopefully as a church, we're working through in our own hearts. What does this book mean for us? How can we draw out from it those principles that are really going to help us become more and more like Christ? And if you look at it, This book really deals with singleness. It deals with relationships. In fact, if the Song of Solomon is a book about the relationship between a husband and wife, the book of Ruth is really about how you deal with relationships leading up to marriage. So there's many, many principles here for those who are navigating that and in singleness leading to marriage. And it's really about how not to awaken love until it's time. That's what Song of Solomon said in chapter 2, verse 7, and other places in the Song of Solomon. Do not awaken love until it's time. When is its time? Genesis 2 says the time to awaken love is marriage. And then awakening love before marriage leads to all kinds of problems and all kinds of trouble. And so... Uh, We look at this and uh, we look at Ruth and she is a woman of God. She is a woman of faith. She is a woman who trusts God implicitly. She is a woman who has decided for her life that she's going to love God, follow God, and that she's going to bless others. And specifically, that she was willing to give up her life to follow and bless her mother-in-law, Naomi. And so I want to do a quick review. If you think back, chapter 1. And we talked about bringing things to a necessary end. If you remember, the famine came in the land of Israel. Famine, we know from in the Old Covenant, when the people of Israel faced famine, they should have known, hey, we're not following God well. We need to repent. We need to turn back to God. Instead of that, uh, Naomi's husband, Elimelech, decides, man, there's a good job over there. There's a good paying job. I'm going to preserve my family and preserve my finances. They apparently were people with some level of influence, some level of wealth. And so he decides, surely on the basis basis of a better paying job to move this family to Moab, a place that God had specifically been very clear. That wasn't where God's people were to move to. So he moves him away from fellowship, has moved his family away from worship, has moved his family away from the study of God's word, the fellowship of God's people, the presence of God, because back in the old covenant, God's presence uniquely dwelt in the temple. So he moves him all over there, simply from, he moves him as his wife and sons over there, simply because all he's thinking about is financial. All he's thinking about is economic. And what happens is, not only does he lose all his finances, he loses his life and the lives of his sons. While, at the same time, back in Israel, the people who did repent turned back to God have started to face a time of prosperity. And so Naomi brings things to a necessary end. She ends that. She decides after this decade away that she is going to make her way back. Now broke, and her sons and husband are dead. Uh, she's penniless. She's moving, coming back to the people of God, back into worship of God, back to the land that God had called her to. And so a lot of times, to be able to make forward progress in our life, we need to bring things to a necessary end, don't we? There's things that we need to stop doing, things, things that we need to bring to an end before we can start moving into a season, a better season. In chapter 2, Ruth moves into a better season as she prays that God, she prays for God to bless her, and then she goes out looking for the blessing. She prays for God's blessing, and then she goes looking for the blessing. Did she find it? Yeah, she prayed for God's blessing. She says, please give me grace. Please give me blessing, God. And I'm going to go out. I'm going to find that blessing. She went out. She found that blessing. She so happened to come into a field. Just so happened she's in a field of Boaz, of all people. Not dumb luck, right? The sovereign hand of a providential hand of God, right? And so we saw in chapter 2, she prayed and then went out looking for God's blessing. But she also, in the second part of chapter 2, is good at taking 
counsel. You see, it could have been very easy for her to say, wow, I'm here in Boaz Field, but I feel like I'm a mooch. I'm going to go ahead and head on. I know he said stay here. I know Naomi's telling me to stay there. I just don't feel right about it. I'm going to keep moving. Instead, she said, I'm just going to take counsel. He's saying go spend this time with the maids over there, work with them over the last next six, eight weeks of harvest time. And she takes counsel. If you look at this story and then you look at Ruth's life and say, what would have happened if she did not take counsel? The story would have had a very different ending, right? But she does take counsel. But even as she takes counsel, God's blessing, God's directing, she comes upon, as we saw in chapter 3, everything seems to be coming together. She's, hey, it looks like God's going to provide financially. And in fact, it looks like God's going to provide a husband. It looks like everything's coming together. And then everything comes to a screeching halt when, lo and behold, there's a kinsman redeemer that's closer in line than Boaz, the man that she now wants to be married to. And so if you can imagine everything lining up for your great hopes and dreams, everything that you planned for, everything you desired, everything you never thought could happen, it's all coming together, and then it hits a wall where absolutely there's nothing you can do. You have to wait on the Lord, and not actively wait, but passively wait. There's nothing you can do about the situation, and maybe you've been there. Sometimes we wait actively. We wait while we work. Sometimes we wait passively. We wait, and there's nothing we can do. She found herself in that position. There was nothing that she could do, and that's where we're going to pick up, in fact, today in God's blessing, that God, while she could do nothing, God had been doing things all along. Not necessarily in this big miraculous sense that everybody's looking for. A lot of people are like, man, I just need a word from God. I just, I just need to see a miracle. If I, if I just saw this happen, or if I just had that sign, then I'd know that God's at work in my life. And if that's where your confidence in, you're probably not very confident in God this morning. But if you recognize God's providential care in your life, then you're probably very confident that you are beloved of God and that God is working on your behalf. In fact, I would contend that the scriptures teach that God is not only for your good, he wields the entire universe for his glory and your good. It's just not always apparent, not in all generations, and it won't be apparent in full until the end. But it will come about in the end that we will all look back on this and say, wow, what looked kind of messy from our side always looked very clear from God's side. And so when he's looking on this, he sees his plan being carried out perfectly, not only collectively for his people, but individually for his people. We look at it and say, man, this looks like a lot of loose ends. This looks like a pretty messy deal. I'm not sure how this is coming about. What we need to do is be confident of God's providential blessing that God is very active in the lives of his people, that he's working behind the scenes in all kinds of ways that you and I can't even fathom today for your good. So in chapter 4, we jump in. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the close relative whom Boaz spoke, that is, who was first in line to marry Ruth and to purchase the land from Naomi and care for Naomi, the close relative whom Boaz had spoken was passing by. So he said, turn aside, friends, sit down here. And he went aside and sat down. Now, so what you'll find is this book doesn't revolve around the synagogue or the church. It revolves around their employment. It revolves around their employment. In fact, he goes up to the gate, not the synagogue. So he's wanting to transact a business deal. And in this whole book, no angels, flaming angels show up. No Red Seas part. Nobody speaks to rocks and waters gush out. Nobody walks on water, right? In fact, this is a book where there's a lady, single lady, a single dude, the single lady's mother-in-law, who by her own admission is bitter, and, and so you have these singles, and what is she doing? Trying to squeak out a living, right? Trying to get food on the table, go to work, get food on the table, wake up the next day, go back to work, get food on the table. Very, very practical book, right? Very, very practical. And yet, through it all, you see this, that God is working in this. And so, it's happening, and sometimes I think we tend to think of business and work and our ele other elements of our life, other than reading the Bible and maybe gathering together, these other elements are, yeah, I can endure work, and, but I love worship, I love to read the Bible. But we really need to get a bigger perspective and say, all of life is walking by faith. All of life is an act of worship. Everything in our life is we're learning to bring it under the lordship of Christ. All of our life is learning to say, what, what does it look like to be like Christ in these various things? What does it look like to trust God with my job, with my finances, with my work, with all of these things? And this is a great book on that. And so 
God was certainly in all of these things. In fact, the fact that he says, he goes up to the gate, he's going to square this away. In fact, he had told her, all right, I'm going to deal with this first thing. He heads to the gate, and lo and behold, who's walking by? Wow. How fortunate. You're just the guy I needed to see, right? How fortunate. When we think about how fortunate, is it really that it was, wow, that was really lucky. It wasn't that lucky, was it? Because God doesn't do lucky, right? God doesn't do random. You might look at your life and you might look at things in your life and it may look like God's doing random, right? You may ask questions. Where are you at? What are you doing? How, how come I can't see you and what you're doing right now in my life? But God doesn't do random and God isn't disconnected from his people. In fact, when you look at the providential hand of God, many times you only see it clearly in the rearview mirror, right? But we oftentimes want the out front. I want a miracle. God says, look back what I've done. I want you to speak a word. He says, look back. I've given you 66 books full. I need this. Look back what I've done for you. You can trust me that I'm we're organizing things going forward, right? So it wasn't dumb luck. It wasn't coincidence. It wasn't, wow, how fortunate. This guy happens to be walking along. Over and over these things happen in the book, just like back at the field in chapter 2 where she shows up. Of all the fields she could have picked, all the fields, she happens to show up in Boaz's field. These things are God's providential care, right? If you look back over your life and you've been a follower for any length of time, you should be able to look back and see, man, what I thought that was turning out for something that was going to harm me, actually God meant it for good. Remember Joseph in Genesis 50? What his brothers meant for evil, God meant for, for good. You see, if you can actually trust God at that level, not that he has to come up with another sign, another miracle, another this, another that. Man, if God, if God would just show up to me like Moses. Remember, Moses goes up on the hill. God shows up and writes it on stone and hands it to him, right? I could trust you, God. I would, if you would show up to me you know, uh, later today and, and write something out on stone and hand it to me, then I would trust you. That's not what he does, right? In fact, if you look back, even in the Bible, many of the miraculous things, there's sometimes, there's just seasons where there's just miracle after miracle after miracle, like Jesus' life or Elijah, Elisha. There's seasons where God's doing a lot of miraculous things, but still, on a big grand scale, those were still pretty minimal, right? The overwhelming way that God works is through his providential hand, so that when she shows up and in chapter 2, verse 3, and, and, and she happens to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, you start to see, man, most of the ways that God works are silent behind the scenes ways. And yet, when you read this book, you should go, is God working? God is clearly working. And God intends for you to read this book and say, is God working in your life? And hopefully you answer that by going, yes, because I've repented of my sins. and I've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sins. And I've confessed him as Lord of my life now. I'm turning my life over to him. I'm going to follow him by faith. And so you know, wow, yeah, now I know with all certainty because of the word of God that he is active and he's working in my life. In fact, when you look at chapter 1, verse 6, he said, then when she arose with her daughter-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab for for she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. How did he do that? All their dead crops just miraculously in the morning, they walked out, well, look at this, all these dead crops have wonderful fruit and produce on them. Is that how he did it? No, what she meant was God had visited his people. God started sending rain again. The rain grew crops. The crops produced food. And now the people of God have a harvest. Now they have money again. Now they have food again. Because remember, God withheld some good. God withheld some good. God never withheld all good. You remember, even though the wilderness... like the rock, right? Like, we're not going in there. We're going to get, we're going to get beat up. We're all going to be dead. We're not doing it. God says, you don't want to trust me in that. No way. Fine. I'll still provide for you. It's in the desert though. And you get to eat little wafers, tasteless wafers like these things, right? And morning, noon, and night, 
and you don't have any Tabasco sauce, you don't put salt and pepper on them, you're just going to eat plain Jane white wafers for 40 years. Now, I don't care, uh, even if you're not a picky eater, I think that would get boring by the end of the first week, let alone the first year or the first decade, right? God says, but don't worry, I got you, I'm providing for you. Is that the provision they really wanted? Was that the provision that God really had in store for them? No, but God withheld some provision from them because they wouldn't trust him. Same in the book of Judges. God continued to go back to withholding some provision. He still loved them. He still cared for them. In fact, Psalm 107 says that he knows how to take a, a beautiful place that's producing crops and turn it into a salt waste, but he also knows how to take the salt waste and turn it back into something beautiful that produces crops. So he can restore all good to you, he says, just as quickly as he can take it from you. And so when you look at this, you say, wow. She looks at that and sees rain and crops and harvest and says, God has visited you. Do you think there was other ways besides looking at that by faith to view that? Wow, what an unlucky situation. I just happened to leave before the rains. Now I'm broke and they're rich, right? You could have looked at that and maybe you've seen things in your own life in question. Well, I mean, you could look at it in other ways. Maybe it wasn't God. That's what the unbeliever does, right? But the believer says, I believe that God's at work. Like, I believe God's for me. Now, I believe that God may withhold some good from my life if I'm not obedient to him, but I'll never be anything but his child. And as a result, he's always going to love me, care for me. He'll always guide and provide for me, and he will one day take me to be where he is because he's already promised that. You, we need to have a growing confidence in God's providential care so that we're not always looking for the miraculous. Does God do miracles? Absolutely. Is it great when God does miraculous puts on display what he's like? Absolutely. But there are large segments, I fear, in Christianity that their whole dependency on whether they're going to trust God is whether or not they're going to see a big sign. And they'll go to passages. Look, you can move mountains. Why can't I move mountains? Why can't I split open rocks? Why can't I? And the question is, why can't you trust God's word? God's word has always been trustworthy. In fact, he repeats that over and over, that this is more sure than the sun, moon, and the solar system being what they are. One day that's going to come to pieces on us. One day mankind is going to have some really, really tough times on this earth. Just read the book of Revelation. But one thing's for sure, the word of God will have changed not one iota, he says. Not one jot, not one tittle. It's trustworthy. And that's what, for all these thousands of years, God has continued to drive us back to saying, I'm trustworthy. I will take care of your life. I will organize your life. I will lead you. I will guide you. I will bless you. But you need to trust me. And if you're not trusting me, I'm going to withhold some good, right? And I'm going to get your attention. I'm going to, I might make things difficult so that you don't have to face even more difficult and painful situations in your life. Well, he continues, and he says this. Chapter 4, verse 2. He took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to them, to the closest relative, Naomi, who has come back from the land of Moab, has to sell the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. So this guy, Boaz, he is a shrewd business guy and he loves God. He's a holy and righteous guy, but he's very good at business. Sometimes I think we get this mindset, well, if you're a shrewd business guy, you couldn't also be a godly guy. Now, he's not breaking any rules here, but he's very shrewd in his dealings. He's very on top of this. So he gets the guys in the city gate. That's where you transact your business. It'd be like going down to the courthouse and a tax day auction or something and buying up land or something like that. This is a place of business, the gate. So he gets these 10 guys, and it just so happens that right on time, this guy walking, is walking by, and he says, man, thank you, God. I recognize your hand. And then, hey, come on over. And he sits down and, and he says, you know, Naomi, she's back from the land of Moab, right? Yes. And in a family back then, you own land. That land was your business because it was an agrar agrarian society. You grew crops. What happened to that land? You passed it to your kids. Then they had a business and they had a place to live. And they passed it to their kids and they had a business and they had a place to live. Your uh, livelihood was attached to that land in this agrarian society. So it got passed down, passed down. If you lost the land, you were out. So she comes back 10 years later, and obviously this is just a piece of land, ground now, she's flat broke, she's got to sell it, and when you got to sell something and you're desperate, what happens to the price? You sell stuff at a fire sale, it's a dirt cheap price. So he says, hey, this lady Naomi, you know Naomi, and uh, this 
this man was either Elimelech's brother or the closest of kin. Now, the Bible, according to Deuteronomy, really required this leveret marriage or brother marriage in regards to a brother. And so this may well have been Elimelech's brother. Certainly, Boaz was probably a little bit more remote to her than a brother. So he wasn't actually obligated to this by the law. But he sits down, and this guy says, wow, she's back. She's got to sell it at a fire sale. Oh, okay. Yeah, land, cheap. Hmm, let's see what he says. Um, uh, he, he says this. So I thought to inform you, saying, buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. If not, tell me, and I, for, tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am after you. He says, you're in first position, I'm in second position. You want to redeem the land? She's selling land at a fire sale. Do you want it? All right. And he said... I'll redeem it. Now, it, Ruth isn't there right now, but you can imagine the heartbreak that she must have felt right now because the land, who, what goes with the land? Marriage to Ruth and care for Naomi. Because remember, this wasn't, uh, this was a lot different than our society, right? We, we typically in our society, especially in the last 40 years, we date, don't we? That's the, the, the approach. Before that, our society had always courted. In other words, you, you went to the person's family, you, you sat down with their brother, sisters, mom, dad, sometimes grandparents. You had to get past the whole family before they approved it. Further step out there was prearrangement. This was a prearrangement. There's still plenty of places around the world that prearrange. And before you start thinking, wow, I'm so glad we date, those who prearrange look at the chaos that is relationships in America and probably often wonder, wow, that's really so, such a great plan. We say, well, I get to pick who I love. They might look at it as, I get to love who I get pick, who, who's picked, right? So they love their pick. We pick who we love. And so sometimes I think we just need to kind of rethink our, in our minds, how should we do it? I'm not saying that this isn't prescriptive. That is, this isn't saying this is how you do that. But the principles are here descriptively to say, we probably need to think about for the singles, when you're looking at marriage, you should be looking at this book and drawing principles from it and saying, man, how can I involve others into so that I can have confirmation, not just, hey, I love this person, but are there others who confirm that that's a good, wise, and godly plan? And if not, would you listen to them like Ruth? Or would you say, well, they don't know, they don't understand, they don't feel, right? Right. Well, so he says, man, I'll take the land. I got it. But then he says this. Then Boaz said, on the day, by the way, there's a little catch in this deal. On the day that you buy the field from the hand of um, Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up a name for the deceased on his, in his inheritance. So he says, oh, by the way, did I mention something real quick? You know that property over there? Uh, when, you mar when, you, when you buy that, this fire sale, uh, there's a lady over there. She's a Moabite, you know, from over there in the Moabites where they worship Chamish and all this stuff. He doesn't go into all the fact that she's converted to Christ. She loves the Lord. She, he just, by the way, she becomes your wife. She becomes your wife. And you can imagine the other guys go, hmm. And there's a mother-in-law in the deal, too, by the way, by the name of Bitter. That's her description of herself. Uh, so, so you might, you know, if somebody came up today and said, hey, I got a smoking hot deal on a house over here. Are you interested? I mean, it's dirt cheap. You're like, oh, I got the money. Yeah. By the way, the, the people in there, one of them really angry, bitter person, they get to live in there still. A uh, little, little hitch there to the business deal. Smoking hot deal on the house. You'd be like, you know, on second thought... No, nah, right? We almost did that in our house. We bought a house, and then the lady goes, well, I don't have somewhere to live yet. Neither do I. I sold my house. I bought the house. We were supposed to, we had an agreement. Well, I don't have anywhere to go, so I'm going to be here. <laughs> I was living at my mom's ranch in one of the things, and we were like, I don't think this can happen. Like, like I would not have bought the house if I knew you were going to be living in it, right? You, you can't do that. Like, we're not doing that. Um, this was the deal. So he comes in and says, you want this great deal on land? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> By the way, the day you do, you get married and you get a mother-in-law and they're going to live with you. Check out this response. The closest relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself. On second thought, that smoking hot deal on that land, I'm just going to pass on it, right? Because... 
I would jeopardize my own inheritance, redeem it for yourself. Like, hey, buddy, this one's on you. You go, you just go for it, man. You get the marriage, you get the mother-in-law, you get the whole nine yards. I'm sticking with, uh, I'm going without it, right? Redeem it for yourself. You have my right of redemption for I cannot redeem it. <laughs> Here's the thing. So the, neither of these guys are married. They're single. Otherwise, it would have been breaking other commands. What happened, according to Deuteronomy, is that, in, and in Jesus picks this up when he's arguing in Matthew 22 against what was, what would be considered in that day, uh, more liberal thinkers, um, but they came to him and said, what happens if the first brother marries a woman and he dies, having no kids? And then the second comes along, he marries her as well, having no kids. Third and fourth, all the way down to seventh. Their point is, they don't believe. These are the Sadducees. They don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They don't believe in heaven. They don't believe in angels. They don't believe in supernatural. They don't believe in any of that stuff. And Jesus comes back. Are you not mistaken? Have you not read, right? They missed the whole point, that the Bible was to be read and understood in a literal fashion, right? So this whole idea of this leveret or brother marriage was still even active all the way into Jesus' time. But what happened was, if the brother marries a woman, they have no kids, the, the brother dies, the next brother, who's single, marries her. The first kid that they have takes the name of the other brother. He actually takes the inheritance for her previous husband. So you can imagine, now let's see, I marry Ruth, but our first kid really gets named after Elimelech, and in time, when he's old enough, he gets this land. So let me see, I end up with a wife, but no land in the end anyways. My first kid then will have his name, not my name. Uh, he's like, I'm out. This would have been a very sacrificial thing, right? This is why in Genesis 38, I believe it is, Onan gets rebuked because he goes in does part of the deal, but does not impregnate the sister because he doesn't want to be sacrificial. He doesn't want to have the offspring raised up to have someone else's name. So this whole idea of being a kinsman redeemer was really giving up of himself to serve her, to carry on the family line, to carry on the family property and the family business. And it was really an act of service. And when you look at Christ, Jesus takes on our responsibility, right? He takes on responsibility for us. He takes on our guilt and shame. He takes on all of our junk, and he gives us his inheritance. So this kinsman redeemer is really a great picture of foreshadowing of Jesus in the ultimate sense, taking on the sins of the world, taking on the sins of his people, bearing our guilt, shame, taking care of all of our junk, setting us free, and then ultimately we're heading towards the wedding feast of the Lamb, right? Ultimately, we're in some way married to God. We inherit with God all of eternity in his kingdom, right? And so it's a pre-shadowing, a pre-picture of this deal. But it's important as you think through here, is God at work in this? Yeah, he's at work in this. And there's no pillars of fire that they're guided by. There's, there's no ravens bringing him manna, right, and bringing like Elijah, fed by these ravens. All those things were true, but that's not in any way what he's doing in Ruth's life. And I suspect in many ways in you and our, my life, we need to look at it and say, does God care for Ruth? Yes. Does God care for me? Hopefully you answer, yes. Is God orchestrating things for Ruth? Yes. Is he orchestrating things in your life for your good? Hopefully you answer, yes. Is Ruth trusting God? The answer is yes. Are you trusting God? Hopefully the answer is yes, right? Is Ruth patient to wait for a good outcome? Yes. Are you patiently waiting a good outcome? Hopefully the answer is yes. Because when you look at this, he goes on, he says, now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption and exchange of land to confirm any manner. A man removed his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attestation in Israel. And so what happened was, not that long ago, I remember talking to this guy, and his dad was in the oil business, and he said, you know, we used to be able to transact multi-million dollar business deals with a shake of a hand. He said, if a man shook my hand, I knew he was good for the money. We walk away, I knew he'd pay it. He says, these days, you can have a stack of legal documents that you've signed, and you can still have them come back and say, I'm not doing it and they'll get a lawyer to fight you. It's just changed, hasn't it? Now we use our signature. Back then they took off one sandal, handed the sandal. For us, not too long ago, it was shaking a hand. Now it's writing your signature. But this was an agreement, right? 
Okay, so he just moved to first position in this, which was his plan all along. Now, keep in mind, this guy's not only a shrewd businessman, that means he's got to plunk down money on this, right? Did this guy have some money, Boaz? Yeah, because if he didn't have money, he could have all the good intentions in the world. Would it have accomplished it? No. Sometimes I think if we are... We, in, in trying to, in, in seeing the dangers of the prosperity gospel, I think we run over here to the poverty gospel and say, I'm godly if I have nothing. Ruth was godly and had nothing. Boaz was godly and had a ton. By God's grace, Boaz could say, I'm buying it. Here's the money. He didn't have to go, let me go pray. I got to figure this out. Don't have any money, right? He was a shrewd business guy. He had the money, and God worked it all out. And so he says, so the closest relative said to Boaz, buy it yourself and remove the sandal. Verse 9, then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Malon. Moreover, I have acquired Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased. So he says, our firstborn will take Malon's name. Our firstborn will ultimately get these lands. So this is very much. It's just he just loves and he's going to care for and he's going to commit himself to Ruth just like Ruth had done for Naomi. And so he says, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the court of the birthplace, you are witnesses today. So you look at this. When Ruth left Moab, she had no hope. In fact, she left realizing and with her mother-in-law, Naomi, going, if you go, you'll never get married over there. Nobody's going to want to marry a Moabite over there. If you go, you are signing up for a life of singleness and a life of hardship. I got nothing, and I've got nothing to offer you. She even said, even if I had a kid today, would you really wait around to get married? You're going to be single. You're going to be penniless. This is going to be a hard road. And what'd she say? Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Your God is my God. She says, if that's what God's called me to do, then that's what I'm doing. What did God do with that? A lot of times it's really in surrender, isn't it? That I'm just going to give up everything. And God says, you know, that's what I, was, what I was waiting for. And he gave her everything. She got married to one of the only godly dudes. Remember during the time of judges in which this takes place, what was the statement? And every man did what was right in their own eyes. Ladies, if you marry a guy who does what's right in his own eyes... You signed up for a miserable life, right? Same goes for guys. But if you were to describe our culture, that's a very good description. And everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And unfortunately, it's become a very good description, even of Christians in our day. Boaz is single. Even though he's gotten older, he's single. Why? Well, in that type of day... We don't know, but certainly he would have stood out as a godly man. And in that type of day, Ruth and Moabites would have stood out too. In a day where everyone's out for themselves, these two selfless people who were different races, different financial positions from different countries, they looked at one another and said, this is what I've been looking for all my life. And they ultimately get married. And it's an amazing love story, isn't it? And it's a story about how to trust God. And it's a tr story about how do we really see God? And we've got to get this because providential hand of God means he's sovereign and he's good. It means he's sovereign and he's good. So everything that comes my way, we need to say Romans 8, 28 and 29. God calls all things that work together for good to those who love him and according, called according to his purpose. Because in verse 29, he says, for, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. So you say, well, God's working for my good because he's working to conform me to the image of Christ. And I, and I hope that you will think this week and start meditating this week on the providential hand of God. Not looking at it going, man, if God would just show me a miracle, if he does, great. If he doesn't, great. You don't have to see a miracle or a sign or the next word from God. You need to trust that God loves you. He cares for you. He's in control. He's orchestrating your life. And yours is simply to say, let me trust. I don't want him to withhold good. I want to experience his good. I want to walk with him. I want to give my life for him. And this is really Tori's, um, what she read and what she had committed to Christ is really, I believe, what Ruth had committed and what all of us should really reflect out of our own hearts is like, say, God, everything I have is in an open hand. My kids, right? Your bank account, your house, your future, it's in an open hand. It's for your glory. 
I am here on this earth to bring you pleasure and glory and to bless people. And in giving my life to glorify God and to bless people, I believe I'll find life. And that's what God said. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that 3,000 years ago, this young woman who had all kinds of other options chose to take the one path, the path of life, the path of faith, the path of following you. And against all odds, lo and behold, you blessed her beyond all that she could have thought or asked. And so we thank you for this illustration. We thank you for this man, Boaz, for this woman, Ruth. Um, we know that 3,000 years ago, their lives reflected what you were desiring, even in a culture that had completely lost its way. Lord, help each of us to wrestle with these things in our own hearts. Help us to be confident in your providential care in our lives, that you're not only sovereign, but you're good. You not only have the power, but you're working with that power for our good behind the scenes in our lives in all kinds of thousands of ways we can't even understand. But one day we will. So we come to worship you. We come to celebrate, Lord. It's because of what we're going to do here in taking communion. It's because of what you did on the cross that we have that confidence that you love us. You've given your life for us. You've taken our sin out of the way. And so now we are free, free to love you, free to be a blessing. Help us to live that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.